This is Sound Noise Acoustics Engineering Podcast, episode number three, brought to you by Sound Solutions, an independent acoustical consulting firm at ssacoustical.com. We provide you with knowledge and resources to address acoustical issues. I'm Bill Holiday. Thank you for joining me on this episode. I'm going to talk about room acoustics a little bit. So when we're evaluating a space, and it could be uh, an existing space or a proposed space, and for almost any use, we look at reverberation time. Not any use, but for a lot of uses. If it's an issue with too high of a noise level, like an industrial issue, or an issue like gymnasium or a swimming pool where it's a loud noise buildup. Um, what would we do at a, a college a lobby area where it's just very noisy noise spilling into different spaces? We look at this. In performance spaces, in lecture halls, um, churches, synagogues, um, places where speech, you want speech understood, or for performance we want music and sound quality to be good. We look at reverberation time. And reverberation time is just a measure of how long sound stays in a space after it's made. Um, it is the echoiness of the room. And, the, and more specifically, reverberation time is defined as the time required for sound in a room to drop by 60 decibels after that signal is turned off. So when we're testing, we bring in a loudspeaker or several loudspeakers in different directions. We'll play this broadband noise like static from a TV that, that's in a lot of different frequencies. And then we turn it off and we just measure how long it stays there. And it will vary depending on where you put that sound source, where you're measuring. Um, but that is is a factor. And the preferred reverberation time in a space depends on the size of that space and the use of that space. So if it's speech, like I was saying, speech, you want shorter reverberation time for the spoken word to be understood, clearly understood. If it's too long and the speaker's not speaking slowly especially, the listener is actually going to hear multiple words at one time and it'll get garbled and hard to understand. And we see that in cathedrals and churches where it's uh, long delayed reflections hitting the receiver, hitting the person and making it hard to understand. Um, in the use of, so the use of the space has, has a big factor. Uh, another point is if music is being played, a long reverberation time is actually desirable so the musical notes can blend together. That's why like singing in the shower sounds better and they're in an echoier environment in a cathedral and you're playing pipe uh, organ. It's nice having the tones last longer. So there's a balance, especially if you're trying to mix uses. Um, but that's uh, important to, to have clarified. What are the uses going to be? What's the volume? And there are tables that are going to give you, uh, and I can put some on the web. Here's some, some examples. So if you have a conference room, about 30,000 uh, cubic feet, mid-frequency reverberation time of about 0.8 seconds um, or less. If we're just dealing with speech, lower the better, less is fine. Classroom, 40,000 cubic feet, around 0.8. Theater. 100,000 cubic feet, around one second for mid-frequency. So mid-frequency is your 500 to 1,000 hertz, and that's generally the most critical because the human ear is most sensitive in that range. Um, and it's where speech is produced. So we're sensitive and, and speech is in those frequency ranges. We can tolerate a little longer at lower frequencies and the nature of absorption usually makes, if you control that mid-frequency, the higher frequencies will tend to be absorbed more. Um, if you're dealing with music, speech quality, it's good to look at the different octave bands and not just do one lump control for the center frequency. But in general, if you control the center, you're going to be, um, you know, probably in a good, good range. Um, 
theater, a multi-purpose rooms, 200,000 cubic feet, 1.7 seconds, a church with organ music, 300,000 cubic feet, uh, two seconds. So what you generally see on these tables is with the use and the volume running on the x-axis, you'll see a, um, a curve for a recommended reverberation time uh, that moves along with that volume. And so once you have a target, you know, the size of the space, you have a target, um, then then you can move forward to, to evaluate if you're in the right zone or if you need to add some different treatments. Now, especially when you're dealing with music, there's other factors you want to look at. You want to look at reverberation time, definitely, but the diffusion of the noise, um, the shape of the room, the close reflections, are you giving some positive natural reinforcement? Um, actually, for lecture halls as well, natural po you know reflections that will help direct the noise to your audience, like a band shell uh, is a good example of that. Um, you know, those are other issues to look at, but for all of these, rever reverberation time is going to be a big one. Now with um, speech, but as well as reducing noise, the more absorption the better. And generally, if we're just dealing with reduction of noise, you just want to cover as best you can. Um, and, and a diffuse array, if, if uh, you spread the absorption out, um, it's generally, uh, you'll be in good shape. With where performance is an issue, or speech, where there's a projection of noise, Generally, you'd like absorption towards the rear, so people aren't getting rear wall reflections. Um, so there's not it doesn't sound like there's noise coming behind them. You don't get long delayed reflections hitting the back of the ceiling and then the back wall and then back to the receiver. Um, now, the reason to do an evaluation, though, is and, and you can do this. There's rules of thumbs. There's formulas. Uh, you can get some. Treatments, I'll step through that a little, but the reason to look at that a little is that um, you, don't, you get diminishing returns with your treatments. So if you put on 2,000 square feet or square feet of absorption, acoustical absorption around, and you get a 3 dB reduction in that reflected noise, you know, you might need another 4,000 to get another 3 dB in, and then another 8,000 to get an additional 3 dB. It, you start getting these diminishing returns at some point. The initial treatment, um, the initial, the first 1,000 square feet of panels will be, will have the largest impact, and then it diminishes. So, um, but you can't hurt yourself if you're trying to reduce noise by putting on more panels. You just, uh, to avoid spending too much, you might want to look at a little more um, in depth. So if you reduce that reverberation time by about 20%, you're only getting a, a 1, per, 1 dB reduction. If you reduce it, cut it in half, that reverberation time in half, cut it from 6 seconds to 3 seconds or whatever that is, uh, or whatever the case is for your space, it's only a 3 dB, a barely perceptible reduction in sound level. So noise being generated in, let's say, a machine in a room will be traveling, will get to that receiver, that worker, the person in that space by two paths. One is the direct noise, the other is the reflected noise. And we'll go over that in the future of how to calculate how much is coming from each. But all we're talking about with reverberation time is getting that reflected noise. So if you have a barrier between the person and the machine, most of that noise is then uh, coming from reflected paths. And, and then cutting the reverberation time in half will give you three. Cutting it by 75% gives you a 6 dB reduction. Cutting it by 90% gives you a 10 dB reduction, making the noise about half as loud. Um, just for, so you know, I mean, you have to do a pretty significant amount of reduction. Now, it, it's not necessarily hard if there's no absorption there. Cutting the reverberation time in half, uh, you know, doubling the amount of absorption might not be that tricky if it's all block and uh, hard surfaces. So what, what we look at when we're calculating it is, 
you have to figure out the volume and then the square footage of each type of surface. So if you have drywall or acoustic ceiling tile or carpet or linoleum or, or whatever type of floor, wood floor, if you have pews or seats, unoccupied, occupied, windows, doors, you come up with the square footage of all those. And then there's this thing called an NRC, which is an average uh, absorption. They, they average the 250, 500,000, 2,000 hertz absorption coefficient. And in general terms, this NRC is an average amount of sound that's absorbed. So if you have this NRC of point nine, let's say, 90% of the noise that hits that surface is absorbed. If you have an NRC of point 0.1, well, only 10% one, only, only is absorbed. The rest is coming back into the room. So for some examples, um, gypsum board is about an NRC of 0.05 or 5%. About 5% does get absorbed. And just moving the panel um, does give you some absorption. The surface will give you some absorption. Empty wood pews, about 0.15 for an NRC, that mid-frequency absorption. Carpeted floor is about 0.35, and it'll depend if there's a pad, the thickness of the carpet, but general numbers. Occupied, upholstered seating, and if we're dealing with five square feet per seat, about 0.8 is your NRC. Um, acoustic ceiling tiles, the acoustic ceiling tile manufacturer will give you an NRC, and they'll give you octave band, and third octave band, but they'll give you the um, that noise reduction coefficient for each band. But in general, they'll be about 0.5, maybe 0.6 for the mineral board, those harder ceilings, up to around 0.9, even 0.95 for the fiberglass squishy acoustic ceilings. Um, and then fiberglass wall panels are 0.9, so 90%. Well, depending on the thickness. Um, Point nine, but the general general rules here. In generally, a one inch thick will be fine for speech for the higher frequencies. You might need two inches if you're dealing with music or lower frequencies if you need to absorb some of that lower frequency noise. Some common acoustical treatments to reduce noise. You have your acoustic panels, fiberglass acoustic panels, which are just six pound density fiberboard. They stretch a fire retardant fabric around it, and usually it's, there's some kind of glue, some epoxy type glue to make it uh, stick. And then they have clips on the back, uh, and you can mount, uh, mount them on the walls or ceilings. Panels usually come in one inch or two inch thick. There's, and, and I have this on the website, um, there's manufacturers in a lot of different communities, and usually it's hard to compete with the local community. So um, we're here in, I'm, I'm in Arizona, and there's a manufacturer in Gilbert in, near Phoenix. And just because of shipping costs, I can pick them up there cheaper than uh, most anywhere else in the country because of basic materials. The ceiling tiles, acoustic ceiling tiles, is a common treatment to reduce the uh, reverberation in a room, help with speech privacy and open office spaces. We look at reverberation time. Um, you can mount them even directly to walls or with a little space. The larger the airspace, that'll help with lower frequencies, give you a little better absorption. There's spray-on acoustical treatments, the cellulose fiber material. It used to be, I mean, it, it doesn't look as bad as, I think at one time it was kind of a bubbly, popcorn-y ceiling, but they're pretty smooth. They're not that bad. They're not super abuse resistant. So if it's in a gymnasium where kids are whipping balls around, it might not be the best fit. But um, they can. They can look nice. They can. Um, they're not that expensive. It's one of the lower cost uh, items. It can work in curves. It's a nice um, treatment if it's difficult surfaces as well. They have to tape off windows or areas they don't want to spray, and they can build up. Uh, half inch, inch, and even thicker uh, treatment. You can even do fiberglass duct liner 
with black facing. You can even have a mylar face to it. That's an inexpensive treatment. There's cotton acoustic panels, one inch thick, six pound density, you know, semi-rigid, made of recycled cotton. I think one of their primary things is grinding up old blue jeans. Uh, it's more expensive than fiberglass, but you don't need to cover it with a fabric, so it ends up being pretty inexpensive. Um, not hugely abuse resistant, but cotton panels, even cotton fibers, they're not as um, difficult to work with as fiberglass. They're not itchy and uh, they're a little more pleasant. There's acoustic fabric mounting systems. They have these tracks where they put fiberglass in and then stretch a fabric around it. And you can make really large panels. Um, you can stretch around interesting shapes. And they can, they can print anything you want on them. I mean, the same goes with the fiberglass acoustic panels. They can stretch different colors, patterns. Uh, they can even do prints and put them up there. There's baffles, acoustic baffles, and that's usually a one or two inch thick fiberglass bagged in some kind of sailcloth or some kind of fabric. And those can be hung, they can have grommets and be hung by, at the seat, in the ceiling or held, um, you know, in different patterns to absorb. There's these lapidaries, which are like real long acoustic panels that can drape, uh, over a ceiling. And those can be nice, have a nice look like for uh, an aquarium, for a swimming pool, some kind of system. There is metal, acoustic, and wood panels, and those are generally just coverings. They have mylar bagged fiberglass, so mylar is that stuff they make balloons out of. You can cover the fiberglass, especially if you're like in a swimming pool or some, somewhere where having it open would damage it. And then you could put perforated metal, or some kind of wood grid system or perforated wood, something that has some open openings to it and get some good absorption. And those get pricey. It's more for looks, aesthetics than anything, or durability too. Fiber or uh, metal uh, in front of fiberglass can be good for a uh, industrial situation or even a pool or where there's kids or gymnasium could be good. Uh, good applications. There's a bit more cost, but they're they're good treatments. Um, I think that's it. I'm, I'm not going to get into formulas here in a podcast, but I will have links on the website. Uh, there's some good rules of thumb, you know, doubling absorption and um, how you can get some rough estimates for how absorptive a space is. Uh, that's it. That wraps up episode number four. Yeah, I've gone long enough. Um, next time we're going to be talking about an environmental noise project. Uh, thank you for listening to Sound Noise Acoustics Engineering Podcast. We try to provide you with knowledge and resources to address acoustical issues. I'm Bill Holiday. This podcast has been brought to you by Sound Solutions Acoustical Consulting at ssacoustical.com. I appreciate any feedback you have, questions, comments. If you want more information of a certain type, let me know. Uh, I'll post it up there. Contact You can contact me by email, bill at ssacoustical.com, or on our website, you can. there's a Facebook link. Write me there. Uh, Twitter, you can write me there. Uh, any which way. Uh, thanks a lot. Take care. Bye.